In a previous lesson, we discussed how the stability factors lead to the differences in energies within molecules due primarily to differences in constitution or connectivity, how things are connected or what atoms are present within the molecules. One of the most remarkable conclusions of the study of stereochemistry is that differences in spatial properties alone, namely differences in configuration and stereoisomerism, can lead to differences in reactivity as well. And although the fundamental phenomena underlying these energy differences are still electronic in nature, we can think about them in spatial terms. And that's what we're going to do in this video and in a few of the future videos in this series, where we connect differences in spatial properties to the energy differences between transition states, intermediates, and products and reaction mechanisms. The focus here is purely spatial. And so the fundamental question we're going to ask and the level we're going to leave it is, are the two molecules, or in a future lesson, the two groups, the same or not the same? Would we expect two molecules with a particular isomeric relationship to behave the same way or a different way? We've mentioned before that because enantiomers have equal internal distances, they have equal energies. This means that in reactions that could generate one of a pair of enantiomers through enantiomeric or mirror image mechanisms, we should expect that both enantiomers are formed with equal rates and that they have equal thermodynamic stability since this is tied to their free energies. To ground this in an example, let's look at the addition of methyl anion to the carbonyl compound shown here, which proceeds through a single step mechanism like this. The methyl group can approach from above or below the plane formed by the carbonyl oxygen, hydrogen, and alpha carbon. And depending on its direction of approach, a pair of enantiomers forms. If the methyl anion comes from above, the carbonyl oxygen is pushed back, resulting in the enantiomer with the S configuration at this newly created stereocenter. If the methyl anion comes from below, the carbonyl oxygen gets pushed forward, and the resulting product has the R configuration at the new stereocenter. Clearly then, the products here are enantiomeric. For this reason, if we were to compare the products just without even considering the reaction itself, we would conclude that they're enantiomers and thus that they must have equal energies because their internal distances are the same. Although I won't show it in detail, the transition states leading to the R and S enantiomers are also enantiomeric, and as a consequence, their energies will be the same. Since the reactants are what they are, and they're associated with a particular energy themselves, the two reaction pathways are exactly equivalent in energy. The activation energies from the reactants to the transition states are equal, and the overall free energy changes associated with each possible process are also equal. This means that we should expect 50% of the reactant molecules to engage in the S pathway, and 50% of the reactant molecules to engage in the R pathway. Because there's no energetic preference for one way or another, the odds of a particular pair of reactant molecules going in one direction or the other are 50-50. The resulting equal mixture of enantiomers is known as a racemic mixture, or racemate. Because diastereomers have different internal distances between their atoms, they have different energies. Reaction pathways that could create a pair of diastereomers, then, will occur with unequal rates, leading to a preference for one diastereomer over the other. And the resulting diastereomers will also have unequal thermodynamic stabilities. This is the same as saying that they have different free energies. This means that diastereomeric mechanisms are not the same energetically. And this is an important distinction with the enantiomeric case that we just looked at. All I've done in this example is added a phenyl ring to this alpha carbon, creating a stereocenter at this carbon with the R configuration. As in the previous case, addition to one or the other faces of the carbonyl group leads to a pair of stereoisomers. However, the stereocenter here is unaffected by this addition. Its configuration is the same no matter which side of the carbonyl group addition occurs to. Consequently, addition of the methyl anion to the top side or from above leads to an R-S product, while addition of the methyl anion from below leads to an R-R product. These two possible products differ at one of their configurations, but not all of them. And as a consequence, the two molecules are related as diastereomers. Although I won't show it in detail, it's fairly easy to see that the transition states leading to these products will also be diastereomeric, since the only difference between the transition states and the final products is partial versus full bonds, a little bit of geometry change, 
and partial versus full charges. By examining the isomeric relationship between the two possible products and concluding that they're diastereomers, we can immediately also conclude that they'll have different energies. It's beyond the scope of Chem 2311 to decide which of these is more stable, as the structural factors involved are relatively subtle, but the important point is that there is a difference that we should expect on purely spatial grounds, just based on the conclusion that these are diastereomers. As a consequence of that difference, and the difference in energy of the diastereomeric transition states, we should expect different rates of reaction leading to the two diastereomers. It's clear from the diagram that the activation energy for the RR pathway, as I've drawn it here, is much higher than the activation energy for the RS pathway. In addition, we should expect different thermodynamic stabilities for the resulting products. It's often, but not always, the case that the transition state stability correlates with the product stability as I've drawn here. Because the activation energy here is smaller than the activation energy in the RR case, we should expect the right-hand pathway to be faster and a greater yield of the product on the right than on the left, owing both to its lower activation energy and to the greater stability of this product relative to the RR product. The important point here and the key difference with enantiomeric reaction pathways is that the two diastereomers are formed with unequal rates and they have unequal stabilities. So we should expect a difference in the amounts of diastereomers that we get out of a reaction that could produce diastereomers. One way to think about this that's somewhat intuitive, I think, is to think about the fact that this unchanged stereocenter biases one of the reaction pathways over the other. All we did from the previous example of this one was add one more group, the phenyl ring, to create a stereocenter at this carbon. And the phenyl ring evidently biases the reaction one way or another. In many cases, this bias is fairly intuitive. For example, a group on a six-membered ring might block one side of the six-membered ring from reacting. However, I'll just emphasize in closing that making those kinds of predictions is beyond the scope of 2311. All we want to do is understand and be able to recognize the difference by identifying the isomeric relationship between the possible products. We'll extend these ideas to groups within molecules with certain types of spatial relationships in the next lesson.